John Sprott was born in Stonykirk in 1780, having trained as a minister with the RP Church, but being unable to find a congregation in Scotland. At the age of 38, he moved to Nova Scotia in Canada, where he was greatly used by God. But part of his heart always remained in Scotland. And he said at one point that seeing crossing the Atlantic was now such an easy thing, it only took 10 days. He would like to get home once every seven years to see the heather and breathe its fragrance. However, on one of those journeys home when he was at the age now of 63, 25 years after he'd left, when he got back to Stonykirk, he knew no one. He asked an old man, where are my schoolfellows? And the man pointed him to the burial ground. Sprott said that he couldn't move three steps there without treading on the dust of some well-known acquaintance. Describing the trip to a friend, he said, I was quite lost. He said, the dark blue sea, the brown hills of Loch Ryan and the green woods of Culhorn have the same appearance that they did when I was at school. But the old inhabitants have all disappeared. There are new merchants in the shops, new lawyers at the bar and new judges on the bench. Summing it up, he said, I crossed the long sea to repair the stock of friendship and renew the acquaintances of early years. But this was impossible. I was quite lost. And I wonder whether you can identify with that. You don't have to move away from somewhere and then come back to your hometown years later to find that it's changed. Some of you know what it's like to have seen many of your school friends buried already. Or to have had many of them move away. You've stayed, but, but they've gone. Perhaps Stranraer is the only place that you've ever lived. And in some ways it's the same, but in other ways it's very different. Familiar shops closed. Old buildings demolished or fallen into disrepair. New ones built. New roads, new schools, new people. You can identify with that line in Abide With Me, which says, change and decay in all around I see. Even for those of us who are younger, the pace of change can be frightening. Young people at school face issues that we never had to face. And that's even aside from all the changes that this pandemic has accelerated. Changes to how people work, changes to how they shop, changes to travel. It can be easy to look out at it all and say with Sprott, I feel quite lost. The pace of change can leave us feeling paralysed. It can leave us feeling as if the rug has been pulled out from under our feet and we've been left behind. Or maybe where you feel the change most isn't in your surroundings but in yourself. Uh, you simply can't do the things that you used to do. Those of us who play football on a Friday night often witness the frustration of some of the older players their brains know exactly what they want to do, but their bodies can no longer follow through with it. They have a weekly reminder that they are mutable, that they've changed, that the passing years have caught up with them. And in light of all those things, the fact that God doesn't change is an amazing truth. Because whatever else changes, God will stay the same he will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so even if it feels like the carpet is being swept from under our feet, we can have certainty that actually our feet are planted on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. 
Yes, uh, abide with me contains those words, change and decay in all around I see. But what's the next line? O thou who changest not, abide with me. So this is the great Bible doctrine that we want to consider this morning. The fact that God is unchanging, or if you like big words, immutable. Immutable. Now, to, to mutate is to change. Immutable. God is unchanging. And we're going to look at this theme under two headings. This morning saying, firstly, that if God could change, he wouldn't be God. If God could change, he wouldn't be God. Does God change? Well, even before we get to what the Bible says, just think about what it would imply if it was possible for God to change. Can God change for the worse? I think most people would reject that straight away. If God changed for the worse, he would cease to be God. He would no longer be infinitely perfect. But what about the other side of the coin? Could God change for the better? Well, again, if God could change for the better, that would mean that there was currently some limitation on him, that there was currently some area of imperfection that could be improved on, or that there was an area of imperfection in the past that has been improved on. But if God really is God, if he really is unlimited in every aspect of his being, then there is no room for improvement. We change either for the better or for the worse. We either make progress or we regress. But if God is infinite in being, wisdom, power, holiness and so on, there is no way that he could change. And so we can add changing to the list of things that God can't do. God cannot lie, God cannot die, God cannot deny himself, God cannot change. I heard of someone who actually preached a sermon series on some of those, those things. It was entitled, 12 Things God Can't Do and Why They Should Help You Sleep at Night. 12 Things That God Can't Do and Why They Should Help You Sleep at Night. The fact that we're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and find that God has disappeared or his character has changed, that should help us sleep at night. So if God really is who the Bible says that he is, then he can't change. If God really doesn't have any limits, as we thought about two weeks ago, then he can't change. Because that would imply that either he must become limited in some area or that previously he was limited in some area, but not anymore. So even before we get to what the Bible says, a God who could potentially change would simply not be God. But what then does the Bible say? And listen to these verses. I'm going to give you three references here. Listen to them, not simply for information but to encourage you in these difficult and changing times. Malachi 3 verse 6 For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. James 1 17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And then from Psalm 102, which we read earlier, verse 25. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, speaking particularly about the Lord Jesus there, as we saw from Hebrews 1. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. 
Did you notice, by the way, that none of those verses simply states the bare fact that God is unchanging? But each of them uses that truth as an encouragement to God's people. God is unchangeable. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God is unchangeable. So you can trust him as a continuing source of all good gifts. The good gifts from above are not going to stop coming. God is unchangeable. Therefore you will dwell secure. And particularly in the context of Psalm 102, God's unchangeableness is an encouragement for those who love the church of Jesus Christ but are apprehensive about her future. I mentioned last week the leaked report from the Church of England which suggested that 20% of worshippers won't return after the pandemic. The headline of this week's Spectator magazine is Holy Relic. Holy relic, what will be left of the Church of England after the pandemic? And even though much of the decline of the Church of England can be explained by its abandonment of the gospel, perhaps we look to the future for ourselves and think that the best that we can hope for is to grimly cling on. Even if COVID doesn't have as much impact on the situation in our own context, I'm reminded of a quote from the Banner of Truth magazine a couple of years ago where the author says, In some congregations and denominations, one wonders if the sole aim of the church and its elders has become the simple wish to die more slowly. Is that what we can look forward to as a church? A slow death? Well, listen to the confidence of the psalm. Verse 12, but you, Lord, are enthroned forever. Verse 13, you will arise and have pity on Zion. That is the church. Verse 16, for the Lord builds up Zion. Verse 18, let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. And what's that confidence based on? Well, it's based on the fact that God is king And that he is not going anywhere. And that even though the earth will wear away, God will remain. Well, we we celebrated here in this church uh, recently the the 200th anniversary of the ordination of of William Symington, a a famous minister here. Symington wrote a few books himself. He also uh, wrote a a historical uh, introduction to a work by the Puritan Stephen Charnock on the attributes of God. And here's what Charnock says that Psalm 102 is all about. What's the purpose of Psalm 102? It is, Charnock says, to confirm the church in the truth of the divine promises that though the foundations of the world should be ripped up, that the heavens clatter together and the whole fabric of them be unpinned and fall to pieces and the firmest parts of it dissolved, yet the church should continue in its stability because it stands not upon the changeableness of creatures but is built upon the immutable rock of the truth of God which is as little subject to change as his essence. The church, he says, will continue in its stability even though the whole of creation disintegrates because the church stands not upon the changeableness of creatures but is built upon the immutable rock of the truth of God. So the doctrine of God's unchangeableness isn't simply something for us to know theoretically it's something to help us sleep at night something to help us get out of bed in the morning and something that gives us confidence as we look to the future both personally and as part of the church of Jesus Christ and it's one of the marks of God's people isn't it that those two categories aren't miles apart I trust your attitude isn't that as long as you and your family are fine and healthy and safe and well, that it doesn't really matter what happens to the church of Jesus Christ. Because those who are truly God's people know the truth of verse 14. 
For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. So God's unchangeableness brings us comfort both as we think of our own lives and also as we think of the church. And notice as well how Psalm 102 illustrates God's unchangeableness by describing the most unchangeable things that we can think of and then saying that though they will one day change, God won't change Verse 25 again, of old you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. John Sprott talked about the dark blue sea, the hills of Loch Ryan and the woods of the Culhorn. Almost 200 years later, they're all still here. The the woods are probably much reduced. But even when the dark blue sea and the hills of Loch Ryan are folded in on themselves and disappear, God will still be the same. And once this present world has served its purpose, he will remake it just as he's promised But he will still be God and we will still be his people. Isaiah 51 verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The fact that God will outlast the physical world also gives us confidence that he will still be there for us even when our world collapses. When a loved one is suddenly taken from us without any warning. When we find that someone who we trusted in has deceived us. When we get the diagnosis that we dread. When our vision of what the next 10 years of our life looks like is shattered. When our children move out and we're suddenly empty nesters. When for others the very foundations of their world would collapse. For us underneath all the rubbles, the rubble uh, perhaps uh, of shattered dreams, shattered health, shattered aspirations, unmoved unshaken will be God himself and he will always be there for us and we will be able to say with Habakkuk though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no fruit no food and there be no herds in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will take joy in the God of my salvation Or we'll say with the hymn writer, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My desire for you as your pastor is that you would have that. So that whatever else is taken from you, that God would still be your rock. Because if you set your heart and your happiness on anyone or anything else, they will only disappoint you. Or to put the question another way, what is at the bottom of your joy? In other words, is there something, your health, job, another person, a reputation? And if that was taken from you, you would have nothing left. If someone could take all of those things, would they also take your joy? Or is God himself the bottom? Is he the foundation of your joy? Because one day everything else will be taken from you. So firstly, if God could change, he wouldn't be God. But then secondly, God's standards don't change. Firstly, God doesn't change. Secondly, God's standards don't change. 
If God doesn't change, well, that means that he doesn't change his mind about things. Why do we change our minds about things? Well, either we're given new information that we didn't have before, or we realize that we've had a blind spot in a certain area. We, we come to the conclusion that quite simply we, we were wrong before. Or maybe we, we try an approach, we try something that we think will work and we find in practice that it doesn't. Or maybe we change our mind simply because we bow to outside pressure. and We change our minds about things not because we've been convinced uh, that we were wrong, but simply because the cost of holding them is too much. But obviously none of those things can apply to God. He can never receive new information that he didn't have access to before. He has no blind spots. He is never wrong. And he doesn't make mistakes. And obviously no one can pressure him into changing his mind. And that should be a great relief to us. That when we come to the Bible, we can know that we're coming to God's unchanging word to his ever-changing world that while the grass withers and the flower fades the word of God will stand forever of course human beings aren't like that at all we constantly change our mind on things and that's been particularly clear in recent years when it comes to morality In 1996, President Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act, a law that defined federal marriage as a union between one man and one woman. Hillary Clinton supported it, and in the year 2000, she told a news conference, marriage has got historic, religious, and moral content that goes back to the beginning of time, and I think marriage is as marriage has always been between a man and a woman. In 2007, all the presidential contenders for the following year's election were against same-sex marriage, including Hillary Clinton. And the polls showed that the majority of Americans were against it as well. But as public opinion began to change, well, the politicians changed their views as well. And so by 2013, ahead of her upcoming presidential bid, uh, Hillary and her husband Bill both came out in favour of it. Barack Obama did a similar flip-flop a year or so before. And of course, at this point, people look back on the views that those politicians held less than a decade ago and are horrified by them. They think they were completely blinded by prejudice back then. And if this trend continues then what will people in 50 years' time think about the average person in 2021? They'll think that 50 years ago, even the most progressive politicians and media were dinosaurs or at least had significant blind spots for not supporting whatever the trendy cause will be in 2071. And whether you think gay marriage is a good thing or a bad thing, you can't deny the pace of change. You can't have any confidence that what you believe now will be looked on favourably by future generations or will be looked on favourably by our own culture in five or ten years' time. And of course that works both ways. Perhaps future generations will look back at the abortions carried out in Britain in the second half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st and say that was absolutely barbaric. People look on Christians as slaves who are in bondage to outdated ideas. But actually the real slavery is living life with no fixed moral foundation constantly having to change your views and reinvent yourself based on whatever's trending at the time. And yet are Christians much different from the world in this? How often do people, even professing Christians, write off parts of the Bible by saying, well that was then, this is now. 
How often do they say, well, you just can't expect me to follow that in this day and age. It's just not practical. As if when God gave the Ten Commandments, he didn't have the foreknowledge to know what things would be like a few thousand years down the line. As if he couldn't have envisaged a society like ours. And that if he had, he would have updated his law accordingly. And of course, many churches in Scotland have sought to do that for him. They've sought to change God's word to conform it to the time in which we're living. And what's been the result? Well, they've emptied. Church after church has closed. The Guardian reported a few years ago about a survey which found that churches which stick to the Bible are growing. They quoted the lead researcher as saying, If you're in a mainline church and it's dying, chances are its theological position is what's killing it. So not only does a church flip-flopping in its beliefs make no sense if we believe in an unchanging God, but on a purely pragmatic level, it's suicide. It kills churches. And yet you can see the attraction. You can feel the attraction. You can feel the pressure. A book has just come out entitled Being the Bad Guys. How to live for Jesus in a world that says that you shouldn't. In a very short space of time, Christian standards have gone from being seen as virtuous to being seen as dangerous. And so we have quite simply got to get used to being the bad guys. Not that we crave it, not that we go out of our way to offend people, but we can't be loyal to the standards of both an unchanging God and an ever-changing culture. And actually for Christians to change how they live, to change their principles based on the culture around them, well, it's not only dangerous for them, but it's also harmful and unkind for their neighbours. Because our task is to warn people that God hasn't changed, that his standards haven't changed, and that his promise that one day there will be a day of judgment hasn't changed either. If you're watching this and you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, let me tell you today that there is a day of judgment that's coming. God, well, he hasn't changed, but you must change. God hasn't changed, but you must change. Rather than trying to conform God to yourself, you must be conformed to him. But our problem is that we can't change. You can't change in and of yourself. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. Some people say, I can change, I can change, I'll do better. But you can't. Others say, well, it's too late for me. I can't change, I've lived this way for too long. But both are wrong. The first person is wrong to think that they can change themselves. But the second person is wrong to think that it's too late. Because although you can't change in and of yourself, God can change you. The Holy Spirit has the power to change your life. Maybe you've tried everything to change, to bring satisfaction. Nothing's really worked. Well, God, by his Spirit, has the power to do what nothing else can do. He can change your life. Here is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. And wait for the turning point, because it's one that we don't see coming. Though maybe we should. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Did you see that coming? A list of people who won't inherit the kingdom of God. But then the apostle says, and such were some of you. But, he goes on, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
God doesn't change. His standards don't change. But by his grace, you can change. Whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, those habits, those sins, those patterns of behavior, they don't have to define you forever. They may have marked your life for longer than you can remember, but they don't have to from this day on. Come to him and you will be able to say with John Newton, I am not what I ought to be. This is John Newton, the former slave trader. He says, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's been said that in the beginning, God created man in his own image. And that ever since, man has been trying to return the compliment. In other words, man has been trying to remake God in his image. But of course, that's doomed to failure. God is immutable. But the problem is that since the fall, we are shattered shattered images we're the ones who need it remade. We, we need it remade into the image of God. And that's exactly what God does for us in the gospel. We can't put the pieces together again, but God can. The immutable Son of God took on mutable human flesh. He took on a body that could grow older a body that could suffer and a body that could die and that did die in our place. And now by the power of the Spirit, he conforms us into his image. Romans eight twenty nine, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's your future believer. God will not change But he is changing and will continue to change you by his word and spirit. That though your outer self is wasting away, your inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen.